Chapter Twenty Five of The Sleeper Awakes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Sleeper Awakes by H. G. Wells. Chapter Twenty Five: The Coming of the Aeroplanes. Two men in pale blue were lying in the irregular line that stretched along the edge of the captured Roehampton stage from end to end, grasping their carbines and peering into the shadows of the stage called Wimbledon Park. Now and then they spoke to one another. They spoke the mutilated English of their class and period. The fire of the Ostrogites had dwindled and ceased, and few of the enemy had been seen for some time. But the echoes of the fight that was going on now far below in the lower galleries of that stage came every now and then between the staccato of shots from the popular side. One of these men was describing to the other how he had seen a man down below there dodge behind a girder, and had aimed at a guess and hit him cleanly as he dodged too far. "'He's down there still,' said the marksman. "'See that little patch? Yes, between those bars.' A few yards behind them lay a dead stranger, face upwards to the sky with the blue canvas of his jacket smoldering in a circle about the neat bullet hole in his chest. Close behind him a wounded man, with a leg swathed about, sat with an expressionless face and watched the progress of that burning. Behind them, athwart the carrier, lay the captured monoplane. "'I can't see him now,' said the second man in a tone of provocation. The marksman became foul-mouthed and high-voiced in his earnest endeavor to make things plain, and suddenly, interrupting him, came a noisy shouting from the substage. "'What's going on now?' he said, and raised himself on one arm to survey the stairheads in the central groove of the stage. A number of blue figures were coming up these, and swarming across the stage. "'We don't want all these fools,' said his friend. "'They only crowd up and spoil shots. What are they after?' "'Shh! They're shouting something.' The two men listened. The newcomers had crowded densely about the machine. Three ward leaders, conspicuous by their black mantles and badges, clambered into the body and appeared above it. The rank and file flung themselves upon the vans, gripping hold of the edges, until the entire outline of the thing was manned, in some places three deep. One of the marksmen knelt up. They're getting it on the carrier. That's what they're after. He rose to his feet. His friend rose also. What's the good? said his friend. We've got no aeronauts. That's what they're doing, anyhow. He looked at his rifle, looked at the struggling crowd, and suddenly turned to the wounded man. Mind these, mate, he said, handing his carbine and cartridge belt and in a moment he was running towards the monoplane. For a quarter of an hour he was lugging, thrusting, shouting, and heeding shouts. And then the thing was done, and he stood with a multitude of others cheering their own achievement. By this time he knew, what indeed everyone in the city knew, that the master, raw learner though he was, intended to fly this machine himself, was coming even now to take control of it, would let no other man attempt it. He who takes the greatest danger, he who bears the heaviest burden, that man is king. So the master was reported to have spoken. And even as this man cheered, and while the beads of sweat still chased one another from the disorder of his hair, he heard the thunder of a great tumult, and in fitful snatches the beat and impulse of the revolutionary song. He saw through a gap in the people that a thick stream of heads still poured up the stairway. The master is coming, shouted voices. The master is coming. And the crowd about him grew denser and denser. He began to thrust himself towards the central groove, the master is coming, the sleeper, the master, God and the master, roared the voices. And suddenly, quite close to him, were the black uniforms of the Revolutionary Guard. And for the first and last time in his life he saw Graham, saw him quite nearly. A tall, dark man in a flowing black robe he was, with a white, resolute face and eyes fixed steadfastly before him. A man for all the little things about him had neither ears nor eyes nor thoughts. For all his days that man remembered the passing of Graham's bloodless face, in a moment it had gone, and he was fighting in the swaying crowd. A lad, weeping with terror, thrust against him, pressing towards the stairways, yelling, Clear for the start, you fools! The bell that cleared the flying stage became a loud, unmelodious clanging. With that clanging in his ears, Graham drew near the monoplane, marched into the shadow of its tilting wing. He became aware that a number of people about him were offering to accompany him, and waved their offers aside. He wanted to think how one started the engine. The bell clanged faster and faster, and the feet of the retreating people roared faster and louder. The man in yellow was assisting him to mount through the ribs of the body. He clambered into the aeronaut's place, fixing himself very carefully and deliberately. What was it? The man in yellow was pointing to two small flying machines driving upward in the southern sky. No doubt they were looking for the coming aeroplanes. That, presently, the thing to do now was to start. Things were being shouted at him, questions, warnings. 
They bothered him. He wanted to think about the machine, to recall every item of his previous experience. He waved the people from him, saw the man in yellow dropping off through the ribs, saw the crowd cleft down the line of the girders by his gesture. For a moment he was motionless, staring at the levers, the wheel by which the engine shifted, and all the delicate appliances of which he knew so little. His eye caught a spirit level with the bubble towards him, and he remembered something, spent a dozen seconds in swinging the engine forward until the bubble floated in the center of the tube. He noted that the people were not shouting, knew they watched his deliberations. A bullet smashed on the bar above his head. Who fired? Was the line clear of people? He stood up to see and sat down again. In another second the propeller was spinning and he was rushing down the guides. He gripped the wheel and swung the engine back to lift the stem. Then it was the people shouted. In a moment he was throbbing with the quiver of the engine, and the shouts dwindled swiftly behind, rushed down to silence. The wind whistled over the edges of the screen, and the world sank away from him very swiftly. Throb, 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 up he drove. He fancied himself free of all excitement, felt cool and deliberate. He lifted the stem still more, opened one valve on his left wing and swept round and up. He looked down with a steady head and up. One of the Ostrogite monoplanes was driving across his course, so that he drove obliquely towards it and would pass below it at a steep angle. Its little aeronauts were peering down at him. What did they mean to do? His mind became action. One he saw held a weapon pointing, seemed prepared to fire. What did they think he meant to do? In a moment he understood their tactics, and his resolution was taken. His momentary lethargy was past. He opened two more valves to his left, swung round, and on to this hostile machine, closed his valves and shot straight at it, stem and windscreen shielding him from the shot. They tilted a little as if to clear him. He flung up his stem. Throb, 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 pause, throb, throb. He set his teeth, his face into an involuntary grimace. And crash! He struck it. He struck upward beneath the nearer wing. Very slowly, the wing of his antagonist seemed to broaden as if the impetus of his blow turned it up. He saw the full breadth of it, and then it slid downward out of his sight. He felt his stem going down, his hands tightened on the levers, whirled and ran the engine back. He felt the jerk of a clearance, the nose of the machine jerked upward steeply, and for a moment he seemed to be lying on his back. The machine was reeling and staggering, it seemed to be dancing on its screw. He made a huge effort, hung for a moment on the levers, and slowly the engine came forward again. He was driving upward, but no longer so steeply. He gasped for a moment and flung himself at the levers again. The wind whistled about him. One further effort and he was almost level. He could breathe. He turned his head for the first time to see what had become of his antagonist. Turned back to the levers for a moment and looked again. For a moment he could have believed they were annihilated. And then he saw between the two stages to the east was a chasm. And down this something, a slender edge, fell swiftly and vanished, as a sixpence falls down a crack. At first he did not understand, and then a wild joy possessed him. He shouted at the top of his voice, an inarticulate shout, and drove higher and higher up the sky. Throb, 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 pause, throb, throb, throb. Where was the other, he thought, they too. As he looked round the empty heavens, he had a momentary fear that this second machine had risen above him, and then he saw it alighting on the Norwood stage. They had meant shooting. To risk being rammed headlong two thousand feet in the air was beyond their latter-day courage. For a little while he circled, then swooped on a steep descent towards the westward stage. Throb, 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 throb. The twilight was creeping on apace. The smoke from the street of stage that had been so dense and dark was now a pillar of fire, and all the laced curves of the moving ways and the translucent roofs and domes and the chasms between the buildings were glowing softly now, lit by the tempered radiance of the electric light that the glare of the day overpowered. The three efficient stages that the Ostrogites held, for Wimbledon Park was useless because of the fire from Roehampton, and Streatham was a furnace, were glowing with guide lights for the coming aeroplanes. As he swept over the Roehampton stage, he saw the dark masses of the people thereon. He heard a clap of frantic cheering, heard a bullet from the Wimbledon Park stage tweet through the air, and went beating up above the Surrey waste. He felt a breath of wind from the southwest, and lifted his westward wing as he had learned to do and so drove upward heeling into the rare, swift upper air. Whirr, whirr, whirr. Up he drove and up, to that pulsing rhythm, until the country beneath was blue and indistinct, and London spread like a little map traced in light, like the mere model of a city near the brim of the horizon. The southwest was a sky of sapphire over the shadowy rim of the world, and ever as he drove upward the multitude of stars increased. And behold, in the southward, 
low down and glittering swiftly near, with two patches of nebulous light, and then two more, and then a glow of swiftly driving shapes. Presently he could count them. There were four and twenty. The first fleet of aeroplanes had come. Beyond appeared yet a greater glow. He swept round in a half-circle, staring at this advancing fleet. It flew in a wedge-like shape, a triangular flight of gigantic phosphorescent shapes sweeping near through the lower air. He made a swift calculation of their pace, and spun the little wheel that brought the engine forward. He touched a lever, and the throbbing effort of the engine ceased. He began to fall, fell swifter and swifter. He aimed at the apex of the wedge. He dropped like a stone through the whistling air. It seemed scarce a second from that soaring moment before he struck the foremost aeroplane. No man of all that black multitude saw the coming of his fate. No man among them dreamt of the hawk that struck downward upon them out of the sky. Those who were not limp in the agonies of air sickness were craning their black necks and staring to see the filmy city that was rising out of the haze, the rich and splendid city to which Massa Boss had brought their obedient muscles. Bright teeth gleamed and the glossy faces shone. They had heard of Paris. They knew they were to have lordly times among the poor white trash. Suddenly, Graham hit them. He had aimed at the body of the aeroplane, but at the very last instant a better idea had flashed into his mind. He twisted about and struck near the edge of the starboard wing with all his accumulated weight. He was jerked back as he struck. His prow went gliding across its smooth expanse towards the rim. He felt the forward rush of the huge fabric sweeping him and his monoplane along with it, and for a moment this seemed an age he could not tell what was happening. He heard a thousand throats yelling, and perceived that his machine was balanced on the edge of the gigantic float, and driving down, down, glanced over his shoulder and saw the backbone of the aeroplane and the opposite float swaying up. He had a vision through the ribs of the sliding chairs, staring faces and hands clutching at the tilting guide bars. The fenestrations in the further float flashed upon as the aeronaut tried to right her. Beyond he saw a second aeroplane leaping steeply to escape the whirl of its healing fellow. The broad area of swaying wings seemed to jerk upward. He felt he had dropped clear, that the monstrous fabric clean up turn hung like a sloping wall above him. He did not clearly understand that he had struck the side float of the aeroplane and slipped off, but he perceived that he was flying free on the downglide and rapidly nearing earth. What had he done? His heart throbbed like a noisy engine in his throat, and for a perilous instant he could not move his levers because of the paralysis of his hands. He wrenched the levers to throw his engine back, fought for two seconds against the weight of it, felt himself riding, driving horizontally, set the engine beating again. He looked upward and saw two aeroplanes glide shouting far overhead, looked back and saw the main body of the fleet opening out and rushing upward and outward, saw the one he had struck fall edgewise on and strike like a giant knife blade along the wind wheels below it. He put down his stern and looked again. He drove up heedless of his direction as he watched. He saw the wind vanes give, saw the huge fabric strike the earth, saw its downward vanes crumble with the weight of its descent, and then the whole mass turned over and smashed upside down upon the sloping wheels. Then from the heaving wreckage a thin tongue of white fire licked up towards the zenith. He was aware of a huge mass flying through the air towards him, and turned upwards just in time to escape the charge, if it was a charge, of a second aeroplane. It whirled by below, sucked him down a fathom, and nearly turned him over in the gust of its close passage. He became aware of three others rushing towards him, aware of the urgent necessity of beating above them. Aeroplanes were all about him, circling wildly to avoid him as it seemed. They drove past him, above, below, eastward and westward. Far away to the westward was the sound of a collision, and two falling flares. Far away to the southward, a second squadron was coming. Steadily he beat upward. Presently all the aeroplanes were below him, but for a moment he doubted the height he had of them, and did not swoop again. And then he came down upon a second victim, and all its load of soldiers saw him coming. The big machine heeled and swayed as the fear-maddened men scrambled to the stern for their weapons. A score of bullets sung through the air, and there flashed a star in the thick glass windshield that protected him. The aeroplane slowed and dropped to foil his stroke, and dropped too low. Just in time he saw the wind wheels of Bromley Hill rushing up towards him, and spun about and up as the aeroplane he had chased crashed among them. All its voices wove into a felt of yelling. The great fabric seemed to be standing on end for a second among the healing and splintering vans, and then it flew to pieces. Huge splinters came flying through the air, its engines burst like shells. A hot rush of flame shot overhead into the darkling sky. Two, he cried, with a bomb from overhead bursting as it fell, and forthwith he was beating up again. A glorious exhilaration possessed him now, a giant activity. His troubles about humanity, about his inadequacy, were gone forever. He was a man in battle rejoicing in his power. Aeroplanes seemed radiating from him in every direction, intent only on avoiding him. 
the yelling of their packed passengers came in short gusts as they swept by. He chose his third quarry, struck hastily and did but turn it on edge. It escaped him, to smash against the tall cliff of London Wall. Flying from that impact he skimmed the darkling ground so nearly he could see a frightened rabbit bolting up a slope. He jerked up steeply and found himself driving over South London with the air about him vacant. To the right of him a wild riot of signal rockets from the Ostrogites banged tumultuously in the sky. To the south the wreckage of half a dozen airships flamed, and east and west and north they fled before him. They drove away to the east and north, and went about in the south, for they could not pause in the air. In their present confusion any attempt at evolution would have meant disastrous collisions. He passed two hundred feet or so above the Roehampton stage. It was black with people and noisy with their frantic shouting. But why was the Wimbledon Park stage black and cheering too? The smoke and flame of Streetham now hid the three further stages. He curved about and rose to see them in the northern quarters. First came the square masses of Shooter's Hill into sight, from behind the smoke, lit and orderly with the aeroplane that had landed and its disembarking negroes. Then came Blackheath, and then under the corner of the reek the Northwood stage. On Blackheath no aeroplane had landed. Norwood was covered by a swarm of little figures running to and fro in a passionate confusion. Why? Abruptly he understood. The stubborn defense of the flying stages was over. The people were pouring into the underways of these last strongholds of Ostrogoth's usurpation. And then, from far away on the northern border of the city, full of glorious import to them, came a sound, a signal, a note of triumph, the leaden thud of a gun. His lips fell apart, his face was disturbed with emotion. He drew an immense breath. They win, he shouted to the empty air. The people win! The sound of a second gun came like an answer, and then he saw the monoplane on Blackheath was running down its guides to launch. It lifted clean and rose. It shot up into the air, driving straight southward and away from him. In an instant it came to him what this meant. It must needs be Ostrog in flight. He shouted and dropped towards it. He had the momentum of his elevation, and fell slanting down the air and very swiftly. It rose steeply at his approach. He allowed for its velocity and drove straight upon it. It suddenly became a mere flat edge, and behold, he was past it, and driving headlong down with all the force of his futile blow. He was furiously angry. He reeled the engine back along its shaft and went circling up. He saw Ostrog's machine beating up a spiral before him. He rose straight towards it, one above it by virtue of the impetus of his swoop and by the advantage and weight of a man. He dropped headlong, dropped, and missed again. As he rushed past, he saw the face of Ostrog's aeronaut confident and cool, and in Ostrog's attitude a wincing resolution. Ostrog was looking steadfastly away from him, to the south. He realized with a gleam of wrath how bungling his flight must be. Below he saw the Croydon Hills. He jerked upward, and once more he gained on his enemy. He glanced over his shoulder, and his attention was arrested. The eastward stage, the one on Shooter's Hill, appeared to lift. A flash changing to a tall gray shape, a cow figure of smoke and dust, jerked into the air. For a moment this cow figure stood motionless, dropping huge masses of metal from its shoulders, and then it began to uncoil a dense head of smoke. The people had blown it up, aeroplane and all. As suddenly, a second flash and gray shape sprang up from the Norwood stage, and even as he stared at this came a dead report, and the air wave of the first explosion struck him. He was flung up and sideways. For a moment, his monoplane fell nearly edgewise with her nose down, and seemed to hesitate whether to overset altogether. He stood on his windshield, wrenching the wheel that swayed up over his head, and then the shock of the second explosion took his machine sideways. He found himself clinging to one of the ribs of his machine, and the air was blowing past him and upward. He seemed to be hanging quite still in the air, with the wind blowing past him. It occurred to him that he was falling. Then he was sure that he was falling. He could not look down. He found himself recapitulating with incredible swiftness all that had happened since his awakening, the days of doubt, the days of empire, and at last the tumultuous discovery of Ostrog's calculated treachery. The vision had a quality of utter unreality. Who was he? Why was he holding so tightly with his hands? Why could he not let go? In such a fall as this countless dreams have ended. But in a moment he would wake. His thoughts ran swifter and swifter. He wondered if he should see Helen again. It seemed so unreasonable that he should not see her again. It must be a dream. Yet surely he would meet her. She at least was real. She was real. He would wake and meet her. Although he could not look at it, he was suddenly aware that the earth was very near. The End End of Chapter 25 End of 
The Sleeper Awakes by H. G. Wells. Recorded by James Christopher, JX Christopher at Yahoo.com, in Phoenix, Arizona, September 2008.